Hi, I'm Johnny, UltimatePaperMache.com, and this week two different things reminded me that I wanted to show you these little, I'm going to try to pronounce this, Schleich. I know it's German, I'm sure I did it wrong, but every time I go to the, the feed store to get chicken food, I pick one of these up because they put them right next to the cash register. I think they see me coming. <laughs> So right now I've got quite a nice collection of them. I think they're like six or seven dollars and I've been intending to talk to you about them for a while because they make really nice models for a drawing or a sculpture and much better actually than just a photograph. They don't have all the details. You still have to look at photographs to, to get you know the, the real fine details for your sculpture or your drawing but for it's a really nice way to get started. I finally got around to telling you about them because I just read the first couple of pages of a book I haven't had time to read yet, but Temple Grandin, I love her books. And I wanted to read a part of it because this is what inspired me uh, to do this video about these little, little animals today. Let me read this. She starts out, as I talk about in the book, she says, not fitting in, she didn't fit in obviously because she doesn't think the same way that other people do, but she says, uh, not fitting in can be a huge benefit in seeing things differently or having a brain that processes information in a new way can lead to innovation, discovery, and invention. I started to understand these differences when I realized that I didn't think the same way as other people. Most people think in a combination of words and vague generalized pictures. I'm a picture thinker, or visual thinker, 100%. My mother noticed my abilities in the second and third grade when I painted watercolors of the beach, and then later when I modeled a clay horse that was almost identical to a real horse. When I hear a, a word like dog, my mind clicks through every dog I've seen, like scrolling through photo albums on a phone or looking at Google images. Later, when I started designing industrial equipment, I could draw an accurate blueprint without ever having taken a drafting class. If I could see the structure in my imagination, I could draw it. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't do that. <laughs> I have to have a reference photo or a, a video or something. I was really lucky when I was doing the original alpaca sculpture that this pattern is made from. I was I had actually met Nisa, so I had a video of her and she was looking at me directly, then she turned her head in two different directions and she wandered off so I could kind of see her from the rear. And I was able to get all these different reference photos, basically just getting screenshots from my own video. Most of the time a photographer will try to catch the animal looking straight at you because we're all um, something about humans really make us want to look in the eyes of an animal so there a lot of the photographs are going to be like this but to get a realistic sculpture you need photographs from the side too and hopefully you can get photographs from the side and the front of the same animal <laughs> which is really hard to find you can find photographs of the same kind of animal in different positions, but finding the same individual animal in the same position is really hard. But these guys, reindeer is really cool. <laughs> now they're not perfect. They don't have all the details that you would find in a photograph, but they're a really nice start. I've actually, um, I've gotten quite a collection of them here. <laughs> I haven't actually had a chance to use most of these yet for any of my projects, but this guy really helped when I was doing the original sculpture for my for my ram mask because I, I couldn't find a photograph from the top of a ram's head or even the back of their head because most photographers, that's just not the part of the animal they're interested in. But I needed to know exactly how those horns are attached to the head and where they line up with the ears. And it just wasn't easy to do looking at photographs. But because I had this little ram, I could actually look at this while I was doing my sculpture and it, it came out pretty darn close. This, this is how the ram mask ended up looking and this guy helped me make him. <laughs> This is really a very realistic uh, sculpture, by the way. It's little, but it's, it's quite realistic. Some of them aren't. I've got a raccoon, and I, I don't know where he is. He's really small, and I've, he's in my pile up here somewhere. But he has a like a really long, skinny, almost beak. Uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, 
the person who sculpted that one didn't get the, the raccoon right. But most of them are really close. And I wanted to show you this one here. I didn't actually use this rhino when I was making my rhino mask. This one has one horn and my rhino mask has two. And besides, the mask <laughs> couldn't be realistic anyway because they keep their eyes in the wrong place and it's just a different shape. But I still really liked him when I saw him at the feed store and so I, I went ahead and bought him. And then when I came home, I looked him up to see what kind of rhino this is with one horn. I'll, I'll put it here because I forgot already. <laughs> but when I was looking for it, I saw a photograph of a one-horned rhino that looked exactly like this. And it was so close. I mean, there, um, if you wanted to make a really nice drawing of a one-horned rhino and you wanted it to be really realistic, or if you want to make a sculpture of one, you could use this as a reference and it would be really close. Um, you would also want to look at photographs too, I think, because you can't, they don't have enough room to put all of the details in here. The one reason that I think these would make it a lot easier to draw is because I've always had a hard time with shadows, especially on, well, the shadows don't show up all that much on furry animals. And quite often photographs are taken in fairly bright sunlight, so you don't get a lot of shadows on them anyway. But if you want to make a really nice drawing that has uh, lights and shadows and it looks just a little bit more dynamic, then you have to put those shadows in and I have never been able to figure out where to put them. And a photograph that doesn't have any shadows really doesn't help you very much. But these guys, you can actually move it around and put the, the light from different directions and you get your shadows. So these would be a really great reference for drawings. Like I said, some of them aren't realistic. I think the burrow, I think his muzzle is a little bit too skinny. I know the zebra's is, it's just, it's just really, really skinny. So if, if I was making a drawing of a zebra, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it straight on. But if I was making a drawing of him from the side, this would be a really good reference. Again, with other photos too. If you have a, a whole lot of people that are learning how to draw with you, like a big class or something, you can find these, I think, on Amazon in, uh, in packages. One of them has all of the zoo animals, one of them has all of the farm animals, and you can do it that way. Although picking them up one at a time at the farm store is kind of fun. <laughs> Before I go, there's one other thing that I wanted to mention because it was Temple Grandin's book that I haven't gotten to read yet <laughs> that kind of pushed me to do this video. And that's because another book by Temple, and I can't remember which one, I have read so many of them, um, it would just said something that has really stayed with me for a really long time. And she was hired by a zoo to help them design the cage or the environment for one of their big cats. I think it was a leopard, but I'm not sure. And she watched the cat for a while. She's really good with animals and she can really tell what they're feeling and what's bothering them. And she could see that he was depressed because he was bored. He just wasn't doing natural cat things. And so she designed this, it, it was like a puzzle. Instead of just giving him Food, he had to actually work for it and go find it and, and search and do hunting things that cats are supposed to do. And then she said something that has stayed with me forever and it's that all of us have to hunt. Whether, whether it's a carnivore or an herbivore or a people, we all have a, a need to search for things. And it made me think that that's probably why we like puzzles so much. <laughs> Why we get so easily bored when we're doing the same thing all day long at work. And I think it's also one of the reasons why sculpting and art and making stuff of any kind, no matter what your hobby is, it's kind of like a puzzle. It's a, it's a search for something because you're searching for a way to make things fit together, of, of making things work the way you want them to. It's kind of like a mental hunt in a way. I've heard from a lot of people who say that just getting a hobby, a, a new art form of any kind can really help with their depression. When you're building something, you're not thinking about something else. You're so engrossed in the making of that thing that the invasive thoughts that might have been bothering you just kind of disappear. And I really think that Temple explained that when she said that everybody, these guys, <laughs> 
and these guys and you know all of them I don't have any cats why is that <laughs> I should have a lion or something here but <laughs> but if if we all have that need to search and if that's what really uh, engrosses our minds then that would be one explanation for why art is such good therapy. <laughs> if you totally disagree with me, please, please put a comment down below because YouTube really likes comments. Now that's all I have for you today. Uh, go make something and come back and visit me, ultimatepapermache.com. I'll see you there.